the gentleman who wrote it begins by telling us that God made the universe out of nothing. That I cannot conceive. It may be so, but I cannot conceive it. Nothing, in the light of raw material, is, to my mind, a decided and disastrous failure. I cannot imagine of nothing being made into something any more than I can of something being changed back into nothing. I cannot conceive of force aside from matter, because force, to be force, must be active. And unless there is matter, there is nothing for force to act upon, and consequently it cannot be active. So I simply say I cannot comprehend it. I cannot believe it. I may roast for this, but it is in my honest opinion. The next thing he proceeds to tell us is that God divided the darkness from the light. And right here, let me say, when I speak about God, I simply mean the being described by the Jews. There may be in immensity a being beneath whose wing the universe exists, whose every thought is a glittering star, but I know nothing about him. Not the slightest, and this afternoon I am simply talking about the being described by the Jewish people. When I say God, I mean him. Moses describes God dividing the light from the darkness. I suppose that at that time they must have been mixed. You can readily see how light and darkness can get mixed. They must have been entities. The reason I think so is because in that same book I find that darkness overspread Egypt so thick that it could be felt. And they used to have on exhibition in Rome a bottle of the darkness that once overswept Egypt. The gentleman who wrote this in imagination saw God dividing light from the darkness. I am sure the man who wrote it believed darkness to be an entity, a something, a tangible thing that can be mixed with light. The next thing that he informs us is that God divided the waters above the firmament from those below the firmament. The man who wrote that believed the firmament to be a solid affair, and that is what the gods did. You recollect the gods came down and made love to the daughters of men, and I never blamed them for it. I have never read a description of any heaven I would not leave on the same errand. That is where the gods lived. There is where they kept the water. It was solid. That is the reason the people prayed for rain. They believed that an angel could take a lever, raise a window, and let out the desired quantity. I find in the Psalms that he bowed the heavens and came down. And we read that the children of men built a tower to reach the heavens and climb into the abode of the gods. The man who wrote that believed the firmament to be solid. He knew nothing about the laws of evaporation. He did not know that the sun wooed with amorous kiss the waves of the sea, and that, disappointed, their vaporous sighs changed to tears and fell again as rain. The next thing he tells us is that the grass began to grow, and the branches of the trees laughed into blossom, and the grass ran up the shoulder of the hills, and yet not a solitary ray of light had left the eternal quiver of the sun. Not a blade of grass had ever been touched by a gleam of light, and I do not think that grass will grow to hurt without a gleam of sunshine. I think the man who wrote that simply made a mistake, and is excusable to a certain degree. The next day he made the sun and the moon, the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night. Do you think the man who wrote that knew anything about the size of the sun? I think he thought it was about three feet in diameter, because I find in some book that the sun was stopped a whole day to give a general named Joshua time to kill a few more Amalekites and the moon was stopped also. Now it seems to me that the sun would give light enough without stopping the moon, but as they were in the stopping business, they did it just for devilment. At another time we read, the sun was turned ten degrees backward to convince Hezekiah that he was not going to die of a boil. How much easier it would have been to cure the boil! The man who wrote that thought the sun was two or three feet in diameter and could be stopped and pulled around like the sun and moon in a theater. 
do you know that the sun throws out every second of time as much heat as could be generated by burning eleven thousand million tons of coal i don't believe he knew that or that he knew the motion of the earth i don't believe he knew that it was turning on its axis at the rate of a thousand miles an hour because if he did he would have understood the immensity of heat that would have been generated by stopping the world it has been calculated by one of the best mathematicians and astronomers that to stop the world would cause as much heat as it would take to burn a lump of solid coal three times as big as the globe and yet we find in that book that the sun was not only stopped but turned back ten degrees simply to convince a gentleman that he was not going to die of a boil they will say i will be damned if i do not believe that and i tell them i will if i do then he gives us the history of astronomy and he gives it to us in five words he made the stars also he came very near forgetting the stars do you believe that the man who wrote that knew that there are stars as much larger than this earth as this earth is larger than the apple which adam and eve are said to have eaten do you believe that he knew that this world is but a speck in the shining glittering universe of existence i would gather from that that he made the stars after he got the world done the telescope, in reading the infinite leaves of the heavens, has ascertained that light travels at the rate of 192,000 miles per second, and it would require millions of years to come from some of the stars to this earth. Yet the beams of those stars mingle in our atmosphere, so that if those distant orbs were fashioned when this world began, we must have been whirling in space not 6,000, but many millions of years do you believe the man who wrote that as a history of astronomy really knew that this world was but a speck compared with millions of sparkling orbs i do not he then proceeds to tell us that god made fish and cattle and that men and women were created male and female the first account stops at the second verse of the second chapter you see the bible originally was not divided into chapters the first Bible that was ever divided into chapters in our language was made in the year of grace 1550. The Bible was originally written in the Hebrew language, and the Hebrew language at that time had no vowels in writing. It was written with consonants and without being divided into chapters or into verses, and there was no system of punctuation whatsoever. After you go home tonight, write an English sentence or two with only consonants close together, and you will find that it will take twice as much inspiration to read it as it did to write it. When the Bible was divided into verses and chapters, the divisions were not always correct, and so the division between the first and second chapter of Genesis is not in the right place. The second account of the creation commences at the third verse, and it differs from the first in two essential points. In the first account, man is the last made. In the second, man is made before the beasts in the first account man is made male and female in the second only a male is made and there is no intention of making a woman whatever you will find by reading that second chapter that god tried to palm off on adam a beast as his helpmeet everybody talks about the bible and nobody reads it that is the reason it is so generally believed I am probably the only man in the United States who has read the Bible through this year. I have wasted that time, but I had a purpose in view. Just read it, and you will find about the 23rd verse that God caused all the animals to walk before Adam in order that he might name them. And the animals came like a menagerie into town, and as Adam looked at all the crawlers, jumpers, and creepers, this God stood by to see what he would call them. After this procession passed, it was pathetically remarked, yet was there not found any helpmeet for Adam. Adam didn't see anything that he could fancy, and I am glad he didn't. If he had, there would not have been a free thinker in this world. We should have all died orthodox. And finding Adam was so particular, God had to make him a helpmeet. 
and having used up the nothing, he was compelled to take part of the man to make the woman with, and he took from the man a rib. How did he get it? And then imagine a god with a bone in his hand, and about to start a woman, trying to make up his mind whether to make a blonde or a brunette. Right here, it is only proper that I should warn you of the consequences of laughing at any story in the Bible. When you come to die, your laughing at this story will be a thorn in your pillow. As you look back upon the record of your life, no matter how many men you have wrecked and ruined, and no matter how many women you have deceived and deserted, all that may be forgiven you. But if you recollect that you have laughed at God's book, you will see through the shadows of death the leering looks of fiends and the forked tongues of devils. Let me show you how it will be. For instance, it is the day of judgment, when the man is called up by the recording secretary or whoever does the cross-examining. He says to his soul, where are you from? I am from the world. Yes, sir. What kind of man were you? Well, I don't like to talk about myself. But you have to. What kind of man were you? Well, I, I was a good fellow. I loved my wife. I loved my children. My home was my heaven. My fireside was my paradise. And to sit there and see the lights and shadows falling on the faces of those I love, that to me was a perpetual joy. I never gave one of them a solitary moment of pain. I don't owe a dollar in the world, and I left enough to pay my funeral expenses and keep the wolf of want from the door of the house I loved. That is the kind of man I am. Did you belong to any church? I did not. They were too narrow for me. They were always expecting me to be happy simply because somebody else was to be damned. Well, did you believe that rib story? What rib story? You mean that Adam and Eve business? No, I did not. To tell you the God's truth, that was a little more than I could swallow. Dell with him? Next, where are you from? Uh, I'm from the world, too. Do you belong to any church? Yes, sir, and to the Young Men's Christian Association. What is your business? Cashier in a bank. Did you ever run off with any money? I don't like to tell, sir. Well, you have to. Yes, sir, I did. What kind of a bank did you have? A savings bank. How much did you run off with? One hundred thousand dollars. Did you take anything else along with you? Yes, sir. What? I took my neighbor's wife. Did you have a wife and children of your own? Yes, sir. And you deserted them? Oh, yes, but, but such was my confidence in God that I believed he would take care of them. Have you heard of them since? No, sir. Did you believe that rib story? Ah, bless your soul, yes. I believe all of it, sir. I often used to be sorry that there were not harder stories yet in the Bible, so that I could show what my faith could do. You believed it, did you? Yes, with all my heart. Give him a harp. I simply wanted to show you how important it is to believe these stories. Of all the authors in the world, God hates a critic the worst. Having got this woman done, he brought her to the man, and they started housekeeping, and a few minutes afterwards, a snake came through a crack in the fence and commenced to talk with her on the subject of fruit. She was not acquainted in the neighborhood, and she did not know whether snakes talked or not, or whether they knew anything about the apples or not. Well, she was misled, and the husband ate some of those apples and laid it all on his wife. And there is where the mistake was made. God ought to have rubbed him out at once. He might have known that no good could come of starting the world with a man like that. They were turned out. Then the trouble commenced, and people got worse and worse. God, you must recollect, was holding the reins of government, but he did nothing for them. He allowed them to live 669 years without knowing their ABC. He never started a school, not even a Sunday school. He didn't even keep his own boys at home. And the world got worse every day, and finally he concluded to drown them. Yet that same God has the impudence to tell me how to raise my own children. 
What would you think of a neighbor who had just killed his babes giving you his views on domestic economy?